welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajra. And we've been going through batteries like nothing else. Can you pass me another one? Yeah. And that's all due to our Wiimotes getting an epic workout in Xenoblade Chronicles. Die! And we'll be practicing our chain sword swing with Warhammer 40k Space Marine. classic team-based shooter Counter-Strike is now 12 years old and it's as popular as ever. Goose will be up later to analyse its incredible longevity. But first, can you guess the game for this week? What's going on? Calm down. He... he all of a sudden... He has no pulse. He needs to be treated. One, two, three, four. Five. Oh, some of these are flat and some of these are working, and you've mixed them all up, Barger. Can't work it out. Ugh. Can't work out how to Can put you batteries just in. Do it, and I'll go read the news. <laughs> Good game. Video game research group Vertical Slice recently conducted a study to determine the scariest game on the Xbox 360. The study measured heart rate, sweat levels, and body temperature of both casual and core gamers. The test subjects were subjected to Alan Wake, Resident Evil 5, Dead Space 2, and Condemned, with Dead Space 2 coming out on top as the most frightening. Though the core gamers appeared to be less affected, all test subjects experienced rapidly increased heart rates, stunted breathing, and significant rises in skin temperature. In the wake of successful hacking attacks on the PlayStation Network earlier this year, Sony has hired a security expert, formerly of the US Department of Defense, to help bolster its online defenses. Philip Reitinger, who has also served as director of the US National Cyber Security Center, will be tasked with the unenviable job of preventing any future attacks on the service that currently hosts over 77 million users. Dead Island developer Techland are currently in hot water after two embarrassing slip-ups. You interest in a little salvage work? An unfinished build of the game was uploaded to the Steam service in North America at launch, leaving gamers confused by a number of glaring bugs and glitches. God damn it, this is hopeless. This mistake was followed by users discovering that a female character's in-game skill, Gender Wars, was originally titled Feminist Whore. What a bloody disaster. The studio has apologised, stating it obviously violates professional and ethical standards at Techland and should never have happened. Good game. Developer Relic have a great affinity with the Warhammer 40k universe. Dawn of War 1 and 2 are both excellent RTS games set in that bleak future where space marines and orcs are fighting their way across the stars. And when the opening cinematic opened for those games, oh, I just got your blood pumping. Right in there in the thick of battle, slugging it away with my bolter, carving through those greenskins. This is what we were all really hungry for. Well, it seems Relic thought so too, which is why they've brought us Space Marine. Take the role of Captain Titus, who leads a troop of ultramarines across one of their Forge World planets, which are kind of like giant production worlds for the Imperium. But this particular one has the nasty problem of an orc invasion. Whoa! So you'll be defending key locations while hacking your way through as many orcs as possible. Everything about this game captures the look and feel of Warhammer 40k perfectly. <laughs> From the moment you charge into the fray in your oversized metal suit, you'll be switching between firing a hefty bolt gun and engaging in fierce and bloody melee combat. It's serious carnage, with huge blood sprays and angry cries of rage from both sides. I love good melee, Bajo, and I think they really got the balance just perfect between that close combat and the gunplay. You'll be picking off orcs in high places or behind cover, when suddenly they'll swarm you from all sides and you're there madly swinging axes hammers and chainsaws and wide comboed arcs around you. It's just so satisfying. I also thought it had a really good health system too. Instead of health packs lying around everywhere, you regenerate health by performing a stun and then hitting B. And this will execute a finisher that will see you getting some health back. Yeah, and it makes those finishes something that's necessary, not just something that looks cool. And it keeps you moving forward. 
You'll also have a Fury that you can activate during times of distress once you've filled up a meter, and this really needs to be saved for those epic swarm moments. On normal difficulty, this game can still get quite hard in those all-out bloodbath battles, and even if you're trying to regain health by doing finisher after finisher, you can still go down. You either need to switch to a gun that can take out multiple enemies at close range, or make clever use of that fury to stay alive. Quite possibly my favourite item in this game, Bajor, was that jump pack. Now, you and I share a common love for jetpacks, and I know that this is the kind of game where you couldn't, you know, make your way through the entire campaign with an awesome perk like that at your disposal, but I just felt that every time I got it, it was so fleeting. I mean, I had the first one for a few seconds, and then it wouldn't fit through a tunnel, I had to take it off, come on. And the next time it ran out of fuel... Out of fuel. Sure, guys. Sure. The freedom of flying through the air like some giant metal fairy, landing with a brutal ground slam that stuns anything nearby. It was just bliss. And those areas were a great break from regular combat too. Raining down death from above, and I loved that axe. And there's a good variety of guns too. Everything from plasma guns to bolters that explode orcs from the inside out. But there was one thing that disappointed me, Hex, and that's that even though there were some areas where you just got flooded with orcs and enemies to kill, you spent a lot of time just walking through corridors where nothing really happens and big empty rooms. Yeah, or just opening doors, activating switches, or going up and down elevator platforms, and then more running down corridors. I agree. I mean, there was a bit of a missed opportunity here to add some of that great 40k vehicle action. The 40k universe has so many cool mechs and walkers, it was a shame that we didn't see any of those. I mean, look at this guy. Where was he in the game? They should put him in. Awesome. Also, in our Resistance 3 review a little while back, we mentioned that all the characters in the game kept repeating the main protagonist's name over and over. Joe, Joe. Well, in Space Marines, the words Space Marine will be repeated so many times, it will drive you nuts. Space Marines to kill! Space Marines! Space Marines. Space Marines! Space Marines! What's it called again? Ah, uh, Space Marine! Space Marine! Space Marine! <laughs> we get it, guys. Most of the 40k fans I've spoken to have said the Ultramarines are actually one of the least interesting factions, and that's kind of reflected in the voice acting and story a bit. Rise, Guardsmen. You saved yourselves. We thought you did. We would be, my lord, if not for the Lieutenant. The voice acting isn't bad, it's just a bit bland, and also the story is pretty predictable. Yeah, it's a case of, oh wow, that guy looks pretty shady, I wonder if he's gonna betray me later on. It's a shame it's just so obvious. Also, I've heard that there's this race of space elves which are pretty cool and always working towards their own agenda, so hopefully we'll see an appearance from them if there's ever a space marine too. The marines are impressive though. These guys are eight foot tall death machines. They're one in a billion warriors that have been recruited, trained and genetically modified. So making them come to life in a third person action game was no small task. And I do think Relic have done the Marines justice, but I just wish there was more, particularly on the multiplayer side of things. There are three classes, and they are well balanced. The Devastator is a heavy weapon shooter. The Assault Marine is a close combat specialist with the jump pack. And the Tactical Marine is a balance of the two with more speed than the Devastator and more firepower than the Assault Marine. Yeah, you'll have some great moments where you're carving it up with your jump pack and power axe. That is until the other team responds by deploying more Devastators in the back lines to mow you down. Annihilation, which plays like Team Deathmatch and Seize Ground, which is a node capture mode, are all game types that have been appropriated from the 40k tabletop game, with pretty much the same objectives, and I thought it was nice to see that link to 40k's roots. That being said, with only a handful of maps and two play modes, I felt like I'd experienced all the ways to play Space Marine in just one night of multiplayer. Yeah, two or three of those maps were quite good, but the rest were less memorable. Some of them felt a bit like they are right out of Quake 2 as well, almost like a paintball field that has been dressed up as 40k, just lots of empty corridors and rooms. There are other games out there, like Halo Reach for example, which have thoughtful and balanced maps, but they still feel lived in, but here they all just felt a bit staged. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to admit, the only part of actual tabletop Warhammer that I've ever taken part in is helping with the painting of my mate's figurines. And there's another cool reference back to that in the armor customization options in Space Marine, which allow you to paint your marine using the official color schemes from the tabletop game. And I thought that was pretty rad. Yeah, there's also some good unlocking and ranking to be done on the multiplayer. 
Also, when you die in multiplayer, you can instantly copy the class and weapon setup of your killer, which I loved. It's a great way of keeping you playing through those early ranks because you get a taste of what's to come. Mm. I think that feature should be in every game with weapon unlocks badge. It really helps to even out the playing field. Final thoughts? Well, it's a nice looking game and a decent shooter, but I think it is missing a few vital elements that could have turned it from a good game into a great one. Fans of 40k tabletop will have that connection there, so they'll get more out of it, but for me, it's a 7 out of 10 rubber chickens. Yeah, it is one for the fans, but you know, that combat system really pulled me through and I definitely had a good time with this. But what really let it down for me was that story, and often I'd be in the middle of a fight and it would just suddenly go to a cutscene and I'd feel a bit robbed of that kill. I mean, I was quite enjoying that fight, thank you. Uh, but, you know, I think they really did a great job of recreating that 40k universe, so I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10. I would say, you know, the first one that I was really held captive by, that I, I really had a hard time stepping away from, was the original Star Wars arcade, especially the sit-down cabinet. It really felt like you were encased in an X-Wing, and it was just a kick-ass game. It was a lot of fun to play. Yahoo! You're all clear, kid! Something tells me you've played a lot of Counter-Strike back in the day. Would that be a fair assumption? Yes, I think it's fair to say my friends and I just lived in net cafes for about two years playing this game, and we even slept in the net cafes. And I went back and played it recently, and everyone was so good, or I'm just really crap at it now. <laughs> but it's good to see the trash talk is still there. Well, that's what Counter-Strike's all about. Yeah. Well, Goose has taken some time to look back at this FPS phenomenon. <laughs> I love my first-person shooters, and one of my all-time favourites is the classic Half-Life mod Counter-Strike. But it's been almost 12 years since its release, so like many gamers out there, I'm a bit rusty these days. But that's not to say the game is dead and buried. In fact, far from it. On any given day around the world, you'll still find places like this packed with Counter-Strike players. Launched in 1999, Counter-Strike was developed by Jess Cliff and Min Gooseman Lee. Both were uni friends who spent more time creating the mod than they did on anything else. And when they released their self-made epic in March of 99 on planet Half-Life, the site had 10,000 hits almost overnight. All this was a massive lead-up to the first beta test in June of that same year. The reaction was overwhelmingly positive, and by April 2000, Gooseman and Cliff were developing Counter-Strike alongside the team at Valve. Every PC gamer had a copy of Half-Life, but the thing is, the online mode for that was very simplistic. It was basically deathmatch. And at the same time, there was a mod that came out called Action Quake 2, and it was the first uh, shooter that was kind of realistic-based whereas most shooters at the time were fantasy-based. There was Quake with rocket launchers and lightning guns, but gamers wanted to use AK-47s, basically. Counter-Strike delivered a realistic team-based shooter with real-world weapons, counter-terrorism forces, realistic enemies, and looked a lot better than Action Quake, and it, it boomed. Within months, it was the shooter to play. The concept behind the game is simple. You choose a team, either terrorist or counter-terrorist, and have one life per round to complete your objective. However, intense, addictive gameplay quickly turned Counter-Strike into a masterpiece of team tactics and quick reflexes. Um, when I was first introduced to it, I wasn't really accustomed to um, first-person shooters. Um, I'd played Doom and games like that and Quake in the past, and I was like, yeah, but it's not really for me. But Counter-Strike, I think because I had a group of buddies who were all playing it, it was a little easier to get in, immersed in that particular type of game competitively and lose those hours. That probably explains some of the bags we've got now, to be honest. The first time I played it, uh, it was the first time I played something that was that, that was representing that kind of a reality and the, the brutalness. I don't think any, anything has ever grabbed my imagination quite like that one did at the time. 
One word comes to mind is simplicity. In the competitive scene, you've got five guys on five guys, and that's it, there's no vehicles involved. Everyone's equal to each other. I'd say the very first time I played Counter-Strike Source, experiencing the ragdoll physics and blood spider effects was just absolutely awesome. One reason the game became so popular was how smoothly the engine ran on almost any computer. You didn't need a beast of a rig just to run the thing. Along with this, it was also one of the first to introduce objective-based games for teams. These included protecting groups of hostages and escorting them to safety, or disarming explosives set by the opposing team. Oh, crap. I guess it had made me a bit more of a team thinker in that way, playing with friends, you know, you're always communicating with each other, telling each other what to do and kind of lecturing each other, I suppose. I loved the, the competitive aspect of it. I'd see teams like playing each other in the rivalry and the, the atmosphere was intense, you know, it was like electrifying. All of this made Counter-Strike one of the biggest eSport games out there. The regular updates refined it so well over the years and gave serious gamers one of the most pure playing fields online. It's just, it's simplicity. It's kind of like no frills gaming, but it's, it's got it right. It's got everything. There's nothing spectacular about it. It's just it does everything you would expect from a first person shooter really, really well. Unfortunately, it's not without its problems though. Cheats and hacks have been a huge part of Counter-Strike. But Valve quickly responded to this by banning any players caught cheating for up to two years. These bans have changed over the years and Valve no longer ban players immediately in hopes that they might catch multiple culprits as word spreads of a new hack. And I can't talk about Counter-Strike without mentioning its huge impact on the industry. Many developers credit it as a major influence on a lot of their work. You could see that the stuff that they were pulling together, like defending a bomb, having a reason to be there, shopping in a multiplayer shooter for guns and stuff, was going to have a real impact on the way games went in the future. And in some ways, I think, when you look at multiplayer combat today, all of it kind of, its history spawns from, from either Quake 1 or Counter-Strike, particularly the Half-Life variant, or the stuff that guys did back in Team Fortress. They chiseled it down to its core essence. It was such a competitive game, such a great competitive game. Being able to use your currency to upgrade and, and things like that was, was just amazing. And I think it, it was a great influence for many of the games that I worked on. And, and uh, I know a lot of our team plays and has played Counter-Strike. And um, it's, it's definitely one of the greats. Terrorists win. You know, I think that there are a lot of really good design rules that you can learn from, from Counter-Strike uh, and from the behavior of the Counter-Strike community. I don't know how many hundreds of updates we've done. And every time we do an update, we have our theory for what it is that we're, we're doing. We, we think, okay, this is the behavior that will change. This is how people will react. And then you see what actually happens. And you learn a huge amount by the difference between what your expectation was and what actually happens. So that's everything I do know. Here's what we don't know about Counter-Strike. As the market becomes flooded these days with AAA first-person shooters, is there still a future for Counter-Strike? And will it still be played in another 12 years? Call of Duty is starting to take some of that market share, especially as PCs get more powerful and, and more people can run Call of Duty. But at the same time, a lot of gamers, they like the simplicity of Counter-Strike. You know, it's just that there's no calling in a helicopter to kill your enemies. It's all about you aiming down the sights, shooting that guy. It still is important simply because they're still using it. <laughs> I mean, every, every well, WCG, all of these sort of competitions, they're still using Counter-Strike as kind of like the measure of uh, competitive gaming. I'm sure that at some point Counter-Strike will be the answer to a trivia question rather than, you know, uh, the insanely popular thing it is now. There's one left. Global Offensive does look very promising. New maps, weapons and ranked matches have all generated a lot of hype. So, is it enough buzz to keep Counter-Strike alive? We'll just have to wait and find out. Good game! Every now and then we get a game changer, a game which evolves or redefines a genre. And let's face it, JRPGs have needed one for a little while. Xenoblade Chronicles is that game. Directed by Tetsuya Takahashi, whose work includes Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy, this game is in many ways a masterpiece of storytelling and rich strategic yet accessible gameplay. And it's on the Wii. The Titans were locked in a timeless battle. Until at last, only their lifeless corpses remained. 
there is a big adventure to be told in Xenoblade. We're about 20 hours in and it feels like we're far from finishing it. Things kick off in a massive battle against a formidable and tough enemy known as the Mechon. Robotic beings that like to cause destruction and eat people. You're first introduced to Dunban. He's a really fun hero who wields the Monado, a powerful sword that can slice through metal like it's butter but can't hurt humans. Dunban overextends himself in the first fight, and a year later when the Mechon attack again, he has to pass the sword to Shulk and his friends. This time, it's my turn! Such an explosive start, Hex. Dunban is such a cheeky hero, too. You'll need someone to drag your corpse off. As long as you think you've still got the strength in you, old man. It's up to you to solve the mysteries of the world and unlock the power of the Monado. The Monado might conceal even more power. If we could just... Unlock the Monado's power. There are a heap of cutscenes here, but the dialogue is snappy and the voice acting and direction means you'll never want to reach for that skip button. All right, I'm off. <laughs> well, except for when you're talking to quest givers, they tend to text waffle on a bit. Yeah, but there's so much love and care gone to every single frame in these cutscenes, and I just, I just want more cutscenes, more and more. Really? It all uses the in-game engine too, so there's virtually no loading. There are some moments here that'll just make you sit up and feel stuff. And I won't lie to you, Hex, I may have, I may have teared up a little bit. No, oh, what was? And until I see you again, I will protect everyone. Now, let me protect everyone. Shut up! I keep them real safe inside my belly. Shut up! Choo-choo! It's not sad, um, it's, it's, it's not just that, it's also just emotional excitement in a battle. It makes you fist pump the air. There's great heroes and great villains and right from the get-go all bets are off. It's really high stakes storytelling and I just love the way they always have this big classic anime talk and standoff before every fight and then they get into it. You little maggots need to learn when you've been stepped on. The very British voice acting was a little over the top at times, I thought, but I think it also sort of serves to make the characters more endearing. Thanks. But what really struck me is that even with such simple animations, and let's face it, pretty, pretty creepy faces, they managed to evoke so much emotion in these cutscenes. On the other side of those clouds. Yep. It's our enemy. Our enemy. You do have to let go of the fact that the lip sync is a bit off, though. Yeah, but the environments are so beautiful and the zones have such scale. An easy visual comparison to make would be Final Fantasy XII, but Xenoblade is far more evolved than that game. The world here inspires you to go exploring, and thank goodness for that, because if you wander off and explore, you'll stumble upon collectibles, which often have quest links or just random quests or scenarios. Yeah, and you do need to do a few side quests here and there if you want to progress efficiently, otherwise you might stumble across a boss that you just can't beat. Sorry. But I wouldn't call this game grindy at all, and it's fun wandering about, killing everything you see, including dinosaurs. You can fast travel to anywhere you've been to, so there's no pointless treks to just hand in a quest or go to a store. That being said, I kind of wish there was a better quest tracking system. It's good quick levelling though, and there's plenty of inventory and gear management to keep you busy. There's also friendship affinity buffs and, and a weird gem crafting thing that I never really got the hang of, but they seem to know what they were doing. There we go! To you! Woo! To you! Alright! Alrighty, to me! Alright, alright, good job! So much we could talk about Hex, but we should move on to the combat. And you know, every time I wanted to put this controller down, the combat just pulled me back in because there's a new ability that unlocks with the Monado or a new team member that joins in that mixes things up. You're in a party of three and you can control others, but you have to play just one character when you're in a fight. And it's hard to resist playing Shulk because he's so awesome. In most fights, it doesn't matter too much who you have with you, but in the tough ones, you'll want a tank damage healer setup. Other setups can work, but they're trickier to manage. Come on, we can do it. 
When you're fighting the mech on, you need to use your Monado talents to either buff everyone else so that they can do damage too, or just go for big attacks and let the rest rely on what's called topples. You need to break an enemy first, then topple them, and if you have time, follow up with the daze. When your break abilities are on cooldown, it's all about keeping up health, defences, and weakening the enemy any way you can. Later on in the game, you meet enemies that need to be purged of auras as well as spike damage, and on top of all that, you need to keep an eye on your tank and make sure they're getting all the aggro, and watch out for those nasty vision attacks. It's coming to me. I can't go on. The Monado lets Shulk see into the future during combat as well as cutscenes, so sometimes he can avoid these vision attacks or shield an ally before too much damage is done. Story visions will cleverly keep you playing too, because you'll want to know what that's all about. Yeah, and I just I love that there's so much to think about in all of this combat too. And there's no random enemy encounters, so you'll only engage the enemies that you want to. Everyone, make a run for it! The excellent combat and exploration was at times let down by the controls though. Cycling through some of those abilities just didn't feel efficient enough. You have to go left to right so much and you can only queue a couple of abilities at once. Even though you can set these abilities wherever you want in that bar, another option to bind them just would have been nice. Another downside is the camera control, which can burn in a fire. You're just always fighting it, whether it's exploration or in the battles, and there's so much clutter on screen at once that trying to finagle the camera while you're trying to see everything on screen, it's just frustrating. The lack of resolution and definition in the visuals doesn't help either, and this game just wants more power, deserves more power, and I'm just thinking now, I'm reaching that point where deciding whether I'm going to put another 50 hours into this game, but that means I have to look at all of these jaggies for another 50 hours, You're and they hurt the eyes. a graphic snob, Bajo. I mean, this is such a compelling game. Isn't that enough? No, it's not. <laughs> We've had too much of the good stuff. I've had too much tasty tessellation, and I don't know if I can stare at this. I think we just have to accept that this is a game that was made for the Wii, and I think they've done a pretty good job of squeezing what they could out of it. Yeah, they have crafted something pretty special here, and I just love this world, how it's a giant body of a dead titan and you're climbing over all of its extremities. But we should wrap this up. Hex, final thoughts? Well, I think this is a fantastic game. After some pretty big JRPG disappointments of late, it's great to have Xenoblade just knock it out of the park. I mean, the music alone deserves its own review, the way it ebbs and flows so beautifully, and when you chain those attacks, you know, you just can't help but rock out. Here we go! If you've never played a JRPG before, I think this is definitely one that will hook you in. So I'm giving it 9 out of 10 rubber chickens. I have to agree with you, Hex. I've never really been a huge JRPG guy. I've always understood them and I've had a bit of fun here and there, but I've never had that frothing obsession from you know, that you see from JRPG aficionados until now. This game has changed everything for me, so I'm giving it 9.5 out of 10 rubber chickens. Rock out again. Do yeah. it. Please. One rock out a day. <laughs> So did you guess the game for this week? It was Disaster Day of Crisis on the Wii. This action adventure came out in 2008 and put you in control of Ray Bryce, a member of International Rescue, who must save the world from an evil organisation called Surge. Not exactly the Wii's finest hour. No, but it was made by Monolith Soft, which is hard to say, and also the developer <laughs> that made the excellent Xenoblade Chronicles from this week. So I think they've redeemed themselves somewhat there. Somewhat! All right, Badge, time to get your brown pants on because next week in the show, the third installment in the Gears of War franchise is here and we'll determine whether or not it's been worth the wait. And we'll also check out the fast-paced RPGing of Crimson Alliance. Thanks to all the live tweeters who tweeted along with us and please jump on the forums and leave us some feedback because we care. Yes, we do. Till next time, gamers, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Far too end. Space Marines! Space Marines! It's a bit more like that. Marines! <laughs> 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 terrible. <laughs> <laughs>